Hello, my name is Kurt Schwer, and this is video 19 for Research Tools, the UNHCCOM JHC class. On, this will be on Mercurial, or HG as it's also known, the symbol for Mercury. And Mercurial is a revision control system that we'll be taking a look at in this video. So let me jump into it and start with an introduction. And let's first talk about revision control and tracking uh, things like software. The first thing to note is that uh, email is not a proper backup system. It doesn't really give you any way to deal with differences between things. Um, also another thing that I didn't write here is that the tracking and changing in Word doesn't really give you the same functionality that we're talking about today. So it's kind of similar but doesn't really give you much of what you might see but you might have seen the tracking changes in Word. Um, local only systems like Time Machine on the Mac where you can have the computer track changes and be able to go back. Those are good things but they don't give you the same functionality. And again a third thing that doesn't also give you what you'd like is the things like Dropbox and SugarSync where they're tracking your files and sending them up to the cloud. They often have tools to let you see a few versions but again they don't give you all the functionality of a true revision control system. So while those are definitely helpful, they're not what we want for everything, so we'd like to have more than just those. And let's take a quick peek at the history of free and open source software revision control systems. And the, way back when, uh, we had revision control system, which is a local only, it only deals with a local computer and a you know, set of directories and files. It really only handles one person at a time very effectively. Um, and it's while it's useful, it's definitely been superseded and you no longer need to really learn RCS. The things that I would have used this for uh, up till recently have been taken over very effectively by uh, things like Mercurial that we'll look at today. Um, the, once people got used to being able to version control things locally, they also wanted to be able to work in groups and to have outside locations where you're syncing with the revision history. And one of the early very popular ones was concurrent version system. And it's pretty effective. It's still in use today by quite a few projects. Uh, it's a little crusty, but it definitely gets the job done. But it's got some edges where it's very hard to do things like manage directories and move files around. Uh, it definitely needs some help. And people then tried to improve on CVS with a system called Subversion, or SVN. And Subversion and, and CVS have this idea of a centralized repository that you make, you work on changes locally and then you push them to the central site. And that's great for some systems, but in this course we are definitely dealing with people who go to sea and don't always have internet access at all times. So things like Subversion and CVS, when you go out to the ship and you don't have great internet access or maybe even any at all, it becomes very hard to work and you might have to work for a couple weeks and then put in changes for all sorts of things all in one big batch at the end and that's not very effective. There's ways to work around that by cloning subversion repositories and then doing some syncing. While that definitely works, it's not necessarily very elegant. Uh, with the Linux kernel way back when, there was actually a system of things where they managed patches and there's a tool called Quilt that had the ability to deal with patch sets and being able to manage things sort of in a distributed mechanism, but it really was pretty loose and uh, I've never tried it because it doesn't really fit my work model very well. Uh, it is pretty powerful and useful. And the gold standard today with revision control systems is something called distributed revision control systems. And that's where you have a local server type model where you can interact with uh, changes locally, you can commit them, but you don't need to talk to some remote server that you would with CVS and Subversion. But you can then push between various repositories and you can create the concept of a central server if you'd like. And you don't have to, but you can. And you can also have multiple uh, sites out on the web where you're then pushing your changes to. And there's a good number of these. Uh, some of the early ones are Arch and Bazaar. These are used by some projects, but the two common ones that most people use today are Git and Mercurial. Git was created by Linus Torvalds the, and uh, the creator of Linux and is 
very similar to Mercurial. It's a little bit speedier maybe, and it's got a lot more functionality. But Mercurial is the, the little bit more clean, simple designed interface. And uh, you know, it doesn't really matter whether you use Git or Mercurial, but here I'll be showing you Mercurial because, um, and that leads us to our next thing of why Mercurial. The main reason is that CCOM has decided to make it its default revision control system that they support from the IT team. Um, we could just as easily have used Git, but it's good to be, if you're at CCOM, working with the same tools. And it's the ability to work offline, so it's the same as Git. And centralized uh, server is not required, but Mercurial is actually fairly polished in terms of its user interface, and it's, it's a lot simpler than Git. So we figured that that would probably be a good thing to use for most scientists. Now, if you start with Mercurial, you could switch to Git later on or back and forth or keep both at the same time. There's ways to pull that off. And in the see all list, I've got some good links for you. Um, HG init is a website that's kind of fun by uh, Joel Sposky. And in this tool, it's basically a little web introduction to Mercurial and takes you through steps of getting your handle around Mercurial, and I highly recommend reading this. It's a very fun, well put together site. Uh, you can probably skip the re education of, for switching from Subversion to Mercurial if you haven't done revision control and you're not hooked on Subversion. It's actually easier to learn Mercurial if you haven't done Subversion first because the, uh, the concepts in Mercurial are very different than in Subversion. And it's got some ideas of talking about how to work in teams. Uh, I've worked up to about 60 people with CVS and done a few projects in Subversion with a few people and Git and Mercurial can also handle large teams fairly easily and uh, with the example of say uh, Git and the Linux kernel handling very large numbers of people working together. So it's a very handy site. Um, there's also a free online book, the HG book. You can also buy that as a dead tree or real physical book. And there's a few other links that are helpful in terms of uh, looking at Mercurial. So let's start off looking at some of Mercurial and using it from a simpler use case. So let's start off by looking at someone else's repository. So what you can do is if someone's put something up in the cloud that you'd like to use and it's in the Git, or sorry, the Mercurial format, um, what we can do is we can clone that to our local tree and start to work with those files. So I'm going to show you briefly um, the site that I have for research tools at CCOM. And what I've done is post the research tools class notes into um, a Mercurial site. So we'll be able to work with these things in the actual site. So let's go ahead and clone that. We'll follow the instructions here. So I'm going to go into my tree here. See if I can actually use this with a trackpad. Okay. And slide this. Okay. So cd tilde slash just gets us back in our main home directory. So we're in the research tools home directory if you're using the virtual machine for class. Mictor projects, I already have this directory, so it exists, CD projects. And in here, before I have research tools where I've checked this out, I am going to um, move this out of the way. So research tools, old research tools. So we're going to go ahead and do a HG clone. So I'm just going to go ahead and copy this because it's a long URL. Meta W and paste that in there. Press enter. This is going to reach out to the Bitbucket site and check out the actual repository. Now if we look here in the Bitbucket site, they actually show you this command, how to clone that repository. So we'll go back to, to research tools there. Okay, and we're going to go ahead and run this and it's going to go check out all of that uh, stuff whatever it was in that repository and bring it down to our local machine. So we do an ls and we see there's a research tools directory so ls-l research tools and inside we'll see that there's a whole tree of stuff that's come down from that server that's now being tracked. And over time 
when somebody else puts changes into that repository and like to bring them down to this particular uh, account on this computer, you can uh, pull the updates and we'll go ahead and do that even though there's nothing to do right now since no changes have happened in the last few seconds. But it's a good exercise to go ahead and do that. So cd tilde slash projects research tools. And we can now run the hg pull command which will bring down the any changes. And we'll see here that there were actually no changes found which is expected. And if there were changes, once they're pulled down into the repository, they're not actually applied to the local files until you ask it to. So we can actually do an hg update. Let me get this up to the front. So in our instructions, we have hg update. So we'll say hg update. And in this case, there were zero files updated, no merges, no files removed, no conflicts. So life is good here. We have a repository that's up to date. And let's examine that repository on Bitbucket. So most of these uh, various sites that provide revision control hosting sites for you will provide lots of tools. There's a number of them out there. There's Google Code, there's Bitbucket, there's lots of ones for Git too. And I believe GitHub has picked up Mercurial support. So let's go ahead and take a look at the Bitbucket site for research tools. And there's a number of things to take a peek at. So the overview is where we start off. It's got a little readme about the project. Uh, you can download the site or the, the tools as a tar, gzipped, zipped, bzip2, lots of options there. We can also take a look at the source code. Make sure I'm following the directions here. Yep, so browse the source. So in here, once you're in the source tab, which is right here, we can go ahead and look down here and you'll actually see the same directory structure as we had before. So you can click on things like scripts and it tells you that it was changed four hours ago and it had a message of initial version plus comments. How big is the file? You can click on it and you'll take a peek at uh, script. So it's very nice to be able to uh, take a peek at a site and do all sorts of stuff with looking at it without having to use the command line or even have the code checked out into your uh, working directory in any place. So those are nice. Now up at the top we have a tab called commits. In commits we'll actually see a tree of changes. Now. It's just me working on this project and I haven't made what are called forks of the code and done any branching in terms of working on multiple concepts at the same time and then trying to bring them back together. So on the left here, our tree is a single straight line without too much going on. It says who was the author and it's great because you can collaborate and merge changes together from different people as you try to collaborate on stuff. Now revision numbers are a little bit funky with Git and Mercurial. They've switched from version 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. that's used in CVS and Subversion to using a hashtag. And these crazy numbers relate to the actual changes. And they're not very user friendly, but they're very unique and they work quite well. Uh, once you get used to them, you'll just start pasting them without really worrying too much about them. So let's go ahead and take a peek at one. So if we take a look at a particular patch, we can then see, if we scroll down here a little bit, we can take a peek inside of a particular file and see what's been changed. So green is additions, red is deletions. If you're colorblind, I'm very sorry. Uh, many people haven't realized that red and green are bad choices of color schemes. So you can go through the commit history and you can take a peek at what's changed throughout time and you can look at what's going on and track what's going on on a project. And if you need to figure out what's suddenly broken when you haven't used something for a while, you switch to it and something's changed, these are ways that you can track and look into what's going on. Now, that works pretty well. Um, we can also, if we look at a specific version, so I'm going to click on this link here. When you go through the source tree and you look at, say, that script, and if we pick on, let's go back through source so you can see it. So we click on source, we'll go into scripts, 
And if we look at our screen capture bash shell script, if you look up at our URL up at the top here, it actually has the hashtag in there. Now if you want to be able to link to the most recent version as things change, you can replace this with the word tip instead of having the hashtag in there. Press enter and that URL then will track the latest version. So if you give that to someone with tip in there instead of the, the hashtag, they'll always be seeing the latest version. It's up to you whether or not you want to be showing a specific instance that won't ever change or something that tracks the most recent changes. So that was here in terms of the most recent uh, with tip. Alright, so let's switch from examining the repository uh, on the web to taking a look at it locally. So we'll go ahead and take a peek here. So we're now in Projects Research Tools. We're doing LS, there's all of our stuff. We can say hg dash dash help and take a peek at what's going on. Pipe that to less so we can see some more. And it'll tell you a little bit about uh, the Mercurial setup. It'll give you a list of commands that you can look through. I'll let you read that on your own. There's a lot to Mercurial, so uh, take a peek through there and give the whole thing a read. And the first thing you can do is we can do an hg log and pipe that to less. And this is a list of changes that have happened in this particular repository. Very similar to that change set thing we saw before with a little graph of green down the left. And here it tells you a text description that I, the person who committed it typed in. And you can see that, you know, I've made changes to things and it shows you what's going on. So there's a lot going on in there. So that was in my research tools that I've checked out. And you can do a lot with that. So you can take a peek to various things and um, we'll get more into it as we work with an actual repository, but you can then take a peek at what's in those things. And we can also say, if we say go into a particular directory, look at a particular file, we can say hg log make file pipe less. Now what we did before was just hg log will give us the log of every possible change for all files. If we say a particular file, we'll now be looking at the changes just for that one particular file. So you can see with this particular make file, I've only made one change. It just was added. All right, so let's switch over to something more interesting because you probably want to make your own repository and work with it. So let's go ahead and create a new Mercurial repository or a repo as they're often called. So cd total slash projects. And now if we say hg status in a directory without a Mercurial repository, it actually says, I don't know what you're talking about. This isn't a repository, so I'm confused. What we can then do is we can say hg init to create a repository and we can say dash dash help pipe that to less and that'll give us a chance to take a peek at the help for init and it will show us there's some options and I'll let you read through that on your own. Now we're going to want to create one with a specific name so hg init and then we'll say um, and it, and we're going to call it RT student for research tool student where you might be doing your work for class. And then we'll hit enter. And it works really quickly because it's not doing a whole lot. But this then sets up that we'll have a new directory called RT student right here. So we can cd into RT student. And then we can say hg status. Uh, nothing's going on here, so not much to, to see. And we can say hd log, and there is nothing in the log because we haven't added any files. So let's go ahead and add our first file into our Mercurial repository. So we can say hg, so in hg log, we can say touch readme.txt. Remember, touch, if a file doesn't exist, we'll just create an empty file of with that name. So ls-l, we now have an empty length touch file. We say hg status and Mercurial then says there is a file in our repository that we don't know anything about so it's going to put a question mark on the left to say I don't understand what this file is I don't have any information on it 
So let's go ahead and um, I'm going to quick do something that I forgot to do that I should have before starting this. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, so now we're set up to go ahead and give a try to adding that file into Mercurial. So we can say hg add readme.txt. So what this does says I'm going to add this file into the repository. So it, now it actually hasn't done a whole lot yet. So if we say uh, hg status, we have an A after it over here. It says it's ready to be added. And that's now ready to go for being committed into this repository locally. So let's go ahead and do that. So we'll say hg commit, and then we give it a message. And the thing about messages, this is what goes in the, the log file, or not the log file, but the log that goes with the file. So this is the kind of information that tells a person sort of an overview summary of what the changes are. And it's a real art to creating good log files. Uh, it's definitely a skill that many people have had to work very hard to develop uh, good good log comments. And uh, I can tell you for for certain that if you write a couple page essay in the log comment, people will just get frustrated with you. But if you don't give enough information, they'll also be frustrated. So uh, I encourage you to talk to other people and see what makes for a good or bad log entry. So we'll start off saying empty file to start the project. And if we don't specify a file name, it will commit anything that's ready to be committed. So if we hit enter, uh-oh, we have a problem. We actually need to specify the username that will be associated with that commit. And the way you do that is we need to add uh, some configuration information. So we can say hg help config pipe less. And this gives you information on how to configure Mercurial. And what we'll need to do is actually descri describe in the section here under UI, and we'll need to create a .hgrc file that actually has this information about who we are and how our environment's gonna be set up. So we'll go over to Emacs and take a look. You can also do man hgrc for more information on the, the, research, the resource file. So control X2, we'll split our Emacs buffer We'll do a control X, control F to go open the file, tilde slash dot hgrc, press enter. We're now opening a new file. You may have one already there that you need to edit, but probably not. And we need to get, tell it about our first name, last name, and email address. And since the default editor is VI, which we're not using in this class, we need to tell it that we, need, we prefer Emacs. So we'll create a UI section of the config file. Username equals Kurt Schwer at Schwer at gmail.com. So you put in your email address. Please don't put in mine. Verbose equals true. And editor equals Emacs. Save that. Control X, Control S. Oh, maybe put a new line in there to make sure that works. Control X, Control S. And we now have a Mercurial uh, configuration file that says who we are. So we can try our commit again. Hit the up arrow twice. We're now back at our commit. We can press enter. And our changes were committed. And it gives you that this was change zero. And here is the change set number ID hashtag. So we've now committed our first uh, commit. And we can say hg log readme.txt. It's not very exciting. So let's see. So here is our command, hg log readme, and it tells us our change set. Uh, tag means tip means it's on the, the lead be, uh, part of our repository where we're adding stuff. Who did it, when it was done, which files changed, and here was our log message right here. So that worked pretty well. And let's go ahead and edit that file and make some changes. So control X, control F to go find it. And we'll say projects RT student and press enter. We're now in that directory. I'll select readme, press enter. And we'll just say uh, some sort of comment. So 
this is a place for research tools work by students. This is me working through classes and videos. All right, save that, control X, control S. This isn't a very good readme, but we're just trying to be quick and to show the basic concept. So let's take a look at Mercurial's tracking of that. So we can say HG status. And if we look here, we see an M for modified on our readme.txt. And the great part about Mercurial is now it knows about our last version, and it can look at our current file and tell us what's different. This is called a difference, and that's written, done with the diff command, so hg diff. If you don't specify a file name, it will look for any file as different and show you that. So if you have a lot going on, you do want to specify the file name, otherwise you'll get clobbered with tons of information. So in our case, our diff is actually pretty small. So here it is. It says, here is the file we started with, and with a date and time. Here's the file we have now, date and time or just a couple minutes later, and it said that we've added two lines. That's great. So now we can make a change. So hg, we can commit our change in. So hg commit dash m. Here's our message. So intro lines with basic description. Press enter, it should commit it. So now we've made our change set. So our second one, again, we're counting from zero because we're computer science types here. So one, and we can say hg log on readme, or we can actually specify without the file. So we'll do it with the file. And you'll see there's now two changes here. So here's our first change. And if we scroll back a little bit, here is our second change with our messages. That's pretty nice. Now let's make a third one. And I'll just sign the file, so Kurt 2011, November 27. Save that, Control, Control X, Control S. And we can now commit that, hg commit message sign the file. So we've now got, oops, hg status. Yep, so we're good. Um, so now we have three changes in there, and we can go start looking at our older changes and see what they're like. So we'll take a look. That was Control X1 to just go to one buffer, and Control X0 jump me to the opposite buffer. So press Tab on this to expand it, and we'll CD. We're already there, so we'll just do it anyway. Projects RT student. We can say HG log. We'll see our log of all the changes. Now you probably want to pipe that to less in the future. So hglog less, because there may be quite a few. Now we can look at specific log entries of a file. So we can say hgcat, very much like the Unix command, and we can specify a revision for a file. So revision 0, this will be the very first form of this file. And it should show us the initial file, which was empty, and in fact it was empty. Now we can say cat, and we can get rid of all that revision information, and that'll show us the current version of the file. So that was the beginning and the end of what's going on right now. And we can ask for versions in between. So hg cat dash dash revision one readme.txt. And that shows you our first, well, our second revision number one uh, form of that file. And we can also ask for revision number two. So you'll see that version here. So you always have access to every change of a file that you've got. Even if you delete that file from Mercurial, it will have all that file and all the history of it. So that's the power of revision control systems, is that you have this ability to look back into your files, even when you've left a version behind of something you did you know, months or years ago, and be able to see what's changed and why, because you have the logs and you have the differences. So how do we look at a difference between two versions? We can say hd diff, and that'll give us the changes from our current one, but we can also say dash r for revision, and we'll compare revisions one and two for readme. So this command will show us the difference between revisions one and two, 
and we can see that we added a blank line in our signature. So that's a really powerful tool to be able to look into your code. Um, let's try out some of the functionality. If we delete a file, so if we say rm readme.txt, press enter. Yes, we really want to remove it. Oops, wait, we actually want that file back. We can say hd status and see that the exclamation point says, oh my goodness, the file's gone. Uh, it knows about readme, but it doesn't see it in your current directory. So we can say hg revert readme.txt and it says it's reverting it. We can take a look here and our readme file is back readme.txt. So that's fantastic. If you are fiddling with a file, don't like what you've done to it, gotten yourself turned around as you're trying to do complex coding, for example, you can just delete the file and say revert and you're back to where you were. So now if we do hg status, everything is good. There's no changes. Very powerful. All right. So what makes a mercurial tree? So if we look in this directory, ls-la, we have a .hg directory. So we can uh, ls-la uh, bats showed us and we can then say du.hg see what's in there and there's a couple different directories we can do an ls-l.hg and so mercurial has got this directory of things changing tracking what's going on in the directory so don't fiddle with the .hg directory you'll need that to stay in there if you decide that you don't want this to be mercurially tracked anymore you can always delete that but I recommend being very careful about that so how do we add directories? We can uh, do make dir dash p, so this will create multiple directories, 0, 1, we can create 0, 2, and we can do something where we create a whole bunch at the same time, so 3, 4, 5, 6, press enter, and then we now have a whole bunch of directories, ls-l class, that's great, we can now say hg add class, press enter, hg status, we now have a whole bunch of stuff, we can say hg commit class, oops, and apparently that doesn't seem to be the way to do it, so hg add class doesn't seem to do anything unless you have files in there, and again I'm pretty new at Mercurial, so we'll just go on from there and I'll figure out how to add directories later on and I'll post another video. But let's take a look at working with Emacs. So there's a key that you need to know with revision control and that's control X, V, and V. That's Victor. V is in Victor. And so if we're now on our readme, you can also say another file.txt. And if you look here, I've got HG and the version number uh, is showing you the increment of that particular file and this one shows no mercurial information so a file for mercurial you know something like that with some text if we want to add that file in control X VV is the mercurial or the version control next command and it always tries to ask you to save file if you modify it so we'll say yes and if you if the file isn't under version control it'll register that file if you're not in a mercurial directory it's going to go back to the old rcs way so make sure that you're in a mercurial directory and now control x vv will check in those changes so we'll say an initial file to demonstrate emacs control c control c says we're done in there control c control c it's now checked in and if we want to make another change, we can say another change. Control X VV, um, files up to date. Control X, Control S, save that. Control X VV, and now it realizes there's something different. And we can say a second change for Emacs. Control C, Control C closes that up. And we now have looked at um, the material changes. So Control X B, uh, Let's go take a look at some other commands really quick. We have, um, I'm going to split my window here. So Control X 5 2. 
So now we have two Emacs buffers so I can track things. And we'll switch them around really fast. And in this file we can say uh, control x v oops control x v l and it will list the history for that particular file so if you're interested in what's going on if we've modified stuff so modifications this is control x zero a little distracting modified save that and we can say control x v equals and it does a diff to see what's going on and you can then take a look at the changes and if you want to see an old version you can do control x v tilde and we can say zero for the initial version or maybe one uh, maybe let's see what we got here control g to quit control x b switch to our change log that was change set four change set three so let's look at change set three so we'll do control x v tilde and we'll say three press enter and it now shows you what was at version three so that's uh, pretty powerful and we'll talk more about mercurial in future videos where we can talk about pushing up to a remote location and getting things going but that's it for now thank you for joining me and happy version control